So what is the case simply does not determine what ought to be the case. And that's pretty obvious because unfortunately we don't have all the things we would like to have and uh, this is pretty much exactly the same distinction as the distinction between what I believe and what I desire. I do not believe that I have all the things that I desire. <laughs> okay? So the question is, what is the connection between them? After all, if it isn't facts on which morality rests, then what is it? John Stuart Mill is often derided for having said the following. The sole evidence that it is possible to produce that anything is desirable is that people do actually desire it. And of course, in saying that, he seems to have leapt over the abyss between fact and value with wonderful aplomb. And for that, of course, he's been criticized, doubly criticized, because people have claimed that he's made a gross confusion between two ways in which we use the suffix able, as in something is desirable means that it's a sort of thing that should be desired, whereas if I say that something is visible, then it means that it is possible to see it, but not that it, it ought to be seen. Now, in fact, I think that Mill was perfectly right, because think what we have to say if we do indeed believe that there is no evidence whatever that can be adduced for an ought statement. Well, it seems that in that case there is nothing that can be adduced for an ought statement, in support of an ought statement, because after all, facts is everything that is the case, and if none of that is relevant to my values, then it seems that my values must rest on nothing. So, the question is, what is left if we exclude facts? Well, as you can imagine, philosophers being what they are, this question has not gone unaddressed. And there have been a number of ways in which people have approached this, attempting to, attempting to provide foundations of morality. One way is to say, well, morality is just convention, and you can sort of say it, as it were, from the inside or from the outside. You can say, morality is whatever a gentleman would do. <laughs> this version, this, uh, this approach is actually something that extremely different societies have in common. Um, the sort of British 19th century approach to morality the ancient Greek, in which the word for gentleman was the kalos kagathos, that is to say, the as it were, morally handsome and beautiful person, always a man. And um, in uh, roughly contemporaneous China, 2,500 years ago, Confucius talked about the jinza, that is to say, also something like, it's usually translated as the gentleman. But of course, while you can take as your model the gentleman, if everybody agrees as to who is the model, in a modern multicultural and multi-valuing society, it no longer has any grip. Because, of course, people who are equally admirable and respectable will disagree about morality, and therefore it's not going to get you anywhere. Now, other approaches have to do with God, reason, prudence, and nature, and I'm going to say a few words about each. A particularly popular answer to the question about the foundations of morality, one which of course all of you will know all about, is God commands it. And um, <coughs> there are well-known problems with this uh, proposal, the first being one that was in effect that was in effect pointed out by Plato in a dialogue called the Euthyphro, in which, though not exactly in this form, but from which we can more or less, as it were, extract the following problem. If what is good is what God commands, then 
is it the case that God commands it because it is good, or is it simply the case that whatever God commands is good by definition, and that is the definition of good? Now, the, um, the answer to this, of course, is problematic either way, but the one that I, what I want to point out here, which I'm sure is obvious to all of you, is that even those who do argue that God's command is the origin and the source of morality don't really believe it. And the reason they, that we can say they don't really believe it is that I think that there'd be very few of the most extreme fundamentalists who would actually go along with the commands as expressed in the Bible, given that, for example, there is nothing in either the Old Testament or the New against slavery. Um, slavery is perfectly acceptable as far as a Judeo-Christian um, uh, holy work is concerned, even though it is not perfectly acceptable to the average uh, person in the Judeo-Christian tradition, and consequently, they must have got it from somewhere else. Genocide is frequently enjoined in many biblical passages, and there again, um, various other nasty things that what I cons consider as probably the most vile uh, character in the whole of Western literature goes in for, namely, God. And it can't be, it can't be what people actually get their morality from. Now, there is, of course, the possibility that we just get it from pure reason. This was Kant's approach, and Kant's famous categorical imperative worked like this. And it, 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 has, a, it has a kind of um, wonderfully, I think it has a wonderfully attractive... Um, um, uh, air about it, because it looks as though you're going to be able to get something for nothing. Uh, pure reason tells you that you should only act in such a way and on such a principle or maxim that you could consistently will to become a universal law of nature. Now, the only thing that this really works nicely with is lying. If everyone were always, in every circumstance, to lie, then they couldn't even lie. Because this would undermine the very conditions of language and communication. And I think that's perfectly true, although I think it's very hard to, to think of any other examples of a moral principle for which it works as well as this. But when you think about it, it's completely arbitrary even then. Because, why shouldn't I just say, well, the principle to which I adhere when I lie is that I think it should be a law of nature that everybody always lies judiciously under the right circumstances when they can get away with it, and when it doesn't, it's not likely to undermine the whole practice of lying, of, I mean, of lying and of language. So, it doesn't really work very well. And the mere fact of universalization, the idea that it that you should, as it were, wish it to be a universal law of language, leads to some nice paradoxes as illustrated by what was reportedly said by a, a highly reasonable policeman trying to disperse a crowd in Berkeley after they'd all been instructed not to beat people over the head, but instead to reason with them. And he said, think what would happen if everybody, everybody just stood around. Nobody could get by. <laughs> now, if you think about this, <laughs> it's a nice thought. <laughs> now, there's another approach which consists in saying that 